My name is Courtney Hare. I am a teacher. I am a big like lover of reading. Obviously, I teach English, but I do love to read for leisure myself. Um, I like to play outdoor volleyball. I like to garden. I like to explore. So actually, I took an anatomy and physiology class in college. And one of the only things I remember from that um, was that the professor said, most often when you have internal bleeding of some sort, it is your body's inability to heal itself. And that usually comes in the form of a tumor. And so um, what had happened was I had gotten a teaching job in Othello where I grew up and I um, moved down there. And this was August of 2020. When I moved to Othello, I started showing one symptom and I had blood in my stool and I instantly knew, I knew instantly that I had colon cancer. So I wasn't actually able to go in and see a doctor until October. And my friend's mom, who's a nurse, did a blood test on me and she said I was very anemic. And what ended up, what we ended up finding out when they had taken the tumor out is the blood flow was feeding the tumor. And that's why I was so anemic. He just did, he did a blood test. Um, and then he just did some general stuff. He felt my stomach to see if I had any lumps or bumps. Um, and then he went through and looked at family history. Um, obviously I don't have family history of it. Um, so, and then just my general, like, it was like, you're thin. There's, I mean, there's just no way you don't ha you're not pre-diabetic, all these things. The doctor in Spokane, so I was in Richland, Spokane, then I went to Kennewick. So three different cities, three different doctors. Um, he pretty much did the same thing. I mean, they, they didn't go anywhere extensive because you can't really diagnose it unless you actually get a colonoscopy. So, but the problem was neither one of those two doctors could perform that. And then they, they just dismissed my symptoms. So they were like, well, we're not going to put in a referral for you. And so, um, symptoms kept progressing and I, um, just knew I, I instantly knew when that started happening. And, and so I was just trying to find somebody that could help me find the exact diagnosis, the answer. So the first general practitioner doctor I went to, he dismissed all my symptoms and said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're thin. You don't have a family history. You just need to do some dietary changes. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, I'm going to keep, I'm going to just keep trying to find answers. And, you know, it was in the middle of COVID, so everything was pushed back and then symptoms kept getting worse. And so when I came home for Christmas break, home was Spokane, I saw a different doctor and same thing. He spent about an hour with me, ran some tests, dismissed all my symptoms, but I knew I was sick. I knew I had colon cancer. And so I just kept pushing. And the first doctor in Richland, he actually had put in a referral for me to see a GI specialist. And so I was actually able to see a GI in January of 2021. Same thing. She dismissed all my symptoms. And finally, I just said, listen, like, this isn't about you being right or me being right. This is about figuring out what's wrong. I said, you're speculating and I'm speculating because all of them were saying, you know, we think you have Crohn's or diverticulosis, diverticulosis um, and or a bleeding hemorrhoid. And I said, no, like, I think that I'm sick. And I said, what can we do? And she said, well, we can give you a colonoscopy. You're too young um, and they're very expensive. And I said, well, I'm a teacher. I have great health insurance. I said, we need to do this. I said, I think it'll give me peace of mind knowing that we have tried everything. And so a month later, she did a colonoscopy and found the tumor. So that was February of 2021. Um, and so then that, that whole month and a half that I went through, essentially just, I did nine different tests. I did three, three colonoscopies, a sigmoidoscopy, two CAT scans, a PET scan and an MRI. And there was one other one I did, I can't remember the name of it, but basically all of those tests kind of 
brought me to like the diagnosis of, you know, what are we going to do? What's the plan of action going to be? You know, one of the greatest skills that my parents ever taught me was the ability to advocate for myself and to know your body. And I just knew, I knew I was sick. I had that feeling in my stomach. And I think that um, sometimes science can only go so far. And sometimes you have to, you have to put it in your own hands and, and keep pushing for it. And it was a unique set of circumstances because when I did my colonoscopy, COVID cases were very light. So I was able to go in and get a colonoscopy. When I had my surgery, COVID cases were really light. So they didn't push my surgery back. And it was just the perfect, these were just perfect little windows where things ended up really working out in my favor. I paid a little bit out of pocket, but it, it, it was mostly covered, yes. Um, the problem was, and this is something that I think a lot of people run into when they're getting tests done, um, especially like a colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy, um, my insurance company did not want to pay for the right type of drugs. So I actually didn't know that I was, they, I didn't hear the confirmation. They actually had to tell my parents. And it took eight hours for the drugs that they gave me to wear off. So I actually didn't find out like about the tumor until the next day. My parents waited to call and say, hey, because they they tried to talk to me after the procedure and I was just bonkers. After all of the tests came back, because the original plan was to do some radiation, six weeks of chemo and then do surgery. After the MRI, which is the biggest one, came back, the radiologist calls me and says, this is kind of miraculous, but your tumor is really a lot smaller than we thought. So we're going to operate. Nothing else is lighting up in your body. So we're just going to go for it and operate. So they did. Um, Dr. Holbrook went in and did a lower anterior resection and took out part of my colon, 21 lymph nodes. And then he took out my appendix because he was like, I had a stage four appendectomy patient who's 17 years old last week. He's like, I just thought I'd take your appendix out. So I took that out too. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so he, he spent about four, four hours in surgery. He just, he's one of the best. He just retired last year, but he's one of the best in Spokane. And so, um, I trusted him and we got really good prognosis back. I had a very, I had a stage one tumor. There were just a few little cancer cells that had broken off and gone into one lymph node. So I had a really good prognosis. The prep work was essentially just, I kind of had to go sort of onto a liquid diet about 48 hours before. Um, obviously, uh, they gave me some things that they wanted me to take prior to. Um, after I was, I was in the hospital for about four days. Um, I had a bunch of a series of different things that I had to go through to get out of there. Um, I had round the clock blood work. They would come in at 2 a.m. They'd come in at 6 a.m. They were checking fluids, different things like that. As far as the procedure, um, he just went in. He didn't tell me how much of my colon he took out, but he took out uh, the part of the colon, the sigmoid re region that's the end. He took that part out and did the lymph node pluck. Um, and then after that, it was... It was, I was on a liquid diet for about three weeks. So um, just kind of really giving my bowels a break and allowing things to heal. Um, but he was able to go in and do it minimally. I mean, the incision that he went in, it was about, it's about this big. He was able to go in right underneath my stomach and do it. So I didn't have to do chemo just because of my prognosis. They, But my surgeon and team recommended that I do it, um, just as like an insurance policy essentially. And so I was prescribed two different types. I had an infusion chemo, which they did in, in her, um, through a port. And then I did pill chemo. So I would be, I do one infusion every three weeks. And then I was on pill chemo, um, for two weeks at a time. Day four of chemo journey and the sickness officially hit me Friday night. So I get a, I get a break at the end of capsidabine. 
And then the infusion chemo was called oxaliplatin. And I had side effects with each. With capsidabine, it was um, mouth, hand, and foot syn uh, uh, syndrome or something where you get really bad s sores everywhere. That that wore off. Um, the the other chemo was oxaliplatin. Um, it's a platin uh, it's a platinum chemo, and so um, you it had some really strange side side effects. So. Um, you couldn't touch anything cold. You couldn't ingest anything cold. Um, so like I couldn't drive in my car with the AC on or it could close my throat. So everything had to be room temperature hot and it was in the middle of the summer. And so one of the biggest issues I ran into was I was dehydrated a lot. Um, I was hospitalized two different times for dehydration, um, which was scary, you know, but um, and then I lost a lot of weight. I, I think I lost about 25 pounds and just trying to, you know, eat when you're not hungry, watch what you eat. You know, they tell you, you can't have raw fruits and vegetables while you're on chemo, which is so weird because you should be eating healthy foods. And they just kind of said, eat what you can. So, um, the first two days after infusion chemo and pill chemo, you're like the sickest. Um, it's really, you're nauseous. It's really, really hard to get up and move around. Um, with oxaliplatin, it's, um, like I said, it's a platinum chemo. And so it causes neuropathy. So you have a lot of tingling going on in your body. And it got to the point where it, like, I, my eyes were affected by it. It was like I could taste it in my mouth. It was very like all consuming all throughout my body. And so I did my own research about my particular prognosis. And I, you know, decided that, um, based on what I had researched, I stopped oxaliplatin at four rounds. Um, that's the infusion chemo. A lot of patients push past that. And there are some patients that end up disabled from doing that chemo. And so I did not want to do that. I didn't want to risk that. Plus, it was making me so sick that I could barely eat. I had, when I was dehydrated, I would go in and get pumped with fluids. That helped. Um, I did take Zofran um, to help with the nausea. Um, but I think the best possible thing, and, you know, you can't be in the sun either when you're on chemo. There's You have all these things that you can't do. I think for me, the best possible thing that helped with the side effects was just to get my mind off of it. Um, so I actually taught, I taught full time while I was on it. So that was just my choice. I wanted to just not, I didn't want to lay in bed every day and dwell on it. That's just kind of my personality. And so I, I decided that I was going to work and help let that be the thing that would help get my mind off of it. So I did, I did oxaliplatin for three months and then I, I did, capsidabine for six months. Um, when I went back to school to teach, I did physical therapy um, and that helped a lot. Um, it helped me just kind of build up strength because I'd lost so much muscle mass and lost so much weight and helped with, with getting through those days. I am almost at the three-year mark of being in remission. I, I count it as April. My, uh, my oncologist counts it as November because that's when I finished chemo, but I think that the surgeon got everything. I just hit like the two and a half year mark. So now I go every six months. I was joking with a friend and I just said, you know, I just, you're part of an exclusive club now and it doesn't really ever leave you. And so I think that um, with this anxiety, I, I just, I do my best to just try and stay positive. It's always really um, quite exhausting, you know, cause it's a four, four day process, blood work, scan, meet with your doctor. Um, my aunt is, uh, a phlebotomist. So she's always encouraging, giving me tips on how to, you know, stay positive and hydrate, make sure you're ready to go. Um, but it is a real thing. And I, I, don't, I honestly don't think that it ever gets any better. I think that you just learn how to manage, how to live with it. If I'm being honest, I mean, the farther out you get, I think, I think you feel better, right? The farther out that you get, you feel better. But um, I don't think that it ever really leaves you. I think that it stays with you. 
I would say that the message, besides this idea of the fact that, you know, you need to advocate for yourself and, and you need to be able to listen to your own body. I think that the message that, that I could share with others is that science only goes so far and knowing and understanding your body is really, really important in listening to your body because to you, if you're sitting in front of this doctor that doesn't know you, you're just a statistic, right? They're trying to kind of see where you fit. And if you don't fit the category, you don't fit the profile, of course, they're not going to suspect anything, right? And um, I also think that the message is that you have to ha you have to hold on to your faith, right? You have to hold on to your faith and you have to keep pushing through roadblocks, things that are in your way. You just got to keep going until you find the answers that you you really desire to have. And for me, that was, I'm sick of hanging out in ambiguity, right? Like, I know I have it. You are speculating, but that's why we have science, right? That's why we have these things. And it doesn't, we shouldn't be profiling people based on their age or the way that they look. We should be listening to the patient, listening to their concerns. So that would be my message is to advocate for yourself and, and to know your, body, know your body, listen to your body and keep pushing until you find answers. And I think for me, that's why I'm alive and well today is I can sit in front of this camera and speak with you is because I advocated and I continued to push until I got the answers that I, I needed. And it's, it's, you know, I don't blame any of them, right? They're doctors, they're human, but I do think that they need to listen to their patients better. I think that they need to listen to their patients, listen to the concerns that they have and really do a better job of, of, putting something in place that is going to help really help eliminate this ambiguity. And for people that, you know, that may not like feel as, as comfortable to advocate, you just have to remember that you know your body.